So, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, a, a typical client for us was a, a developer that needed help somewhere in their capital stack. And uh, we were focused on the 10 fastest growing markets in the country in terms of spending, you know, marketing dollars and whatnot. And so um, we were seeing term sheets for just using a ground up uh, multifamily or value add mm -hmm. um, on the debt side, uh, you know, six and a half to nine percent rates, non recourse, 80 percent loan to cost, a um, couple points. That was pretty standard. Well, now uh, you're looking at, you know, 11 to 13 and a half. And the, and the rate was fixed before. Now it's 11 to 13 and a half floating. 70, maybe 75% loan to cost. And you can, you know, you can get higher with some stretch leverage and that type of thing, but two to three points and still non recourse. So harder and harder to get deals to pencil. We're having this, an extremely difficult time finding LP. Um, we're seeing a lot of scenarios where either someone's loan is expiring and they need a new one and they're looking at, okay, we've been paying, you know, we've had a three and a half, 4% rate. Now we're looking at seven and a half, eight, somewhere in there. And so our net operating income has gone down because higher taxes, insurance, just costs in general. And now we're looking at this higher debt service that we're going to have to cover and they can't. Welcome to the Real Estate Reality Show. I am Adam Gower. I'm your host and founder of GowerCrowd.com which is a source for all things commercial real estate finance related. And uh, this series has a particular focus on distressed commercial real estate, what it is and how to invest in it. So how to survive and thrive these interesting times. Thanks so much for joining us today. My guest today is Creighton Bildstein, who is principal of Platt Capital, Platt Point Capital. Uh, out of Denver. They are a commercial debt and equity provider. And I, I, I forget exactly how it was that I met Creighton, whether it was on LinkedIn or he sent me an email, not quite sure. But one of the things that really drew my attention to what he was saying was that he said that he was seeing significant capital issues for real estate developers and owners. And so we're going to be talking about what exactly he is seeing in the market, making some comparisons with the way that uh, real estate deals were financed, uh, perhaps imprudently in the last two and three years, how some sponsors are still steaming along uh, without any real understanding of what's going on in the market. And he's also, what's particularly interesting about Creighton and the conversation you're going to hear today is all the various options uh, that there are for sponsors to um, solve some of their liquidity problems today. But what we also talk about is the impact of those solutions on limited partners, on the investors in those deals. It's a very important conversation if you are a developer and also if you are a limited partner. Now, if you like this conversation that I have with Creighton and others in this series, uh, please go uh, uh, trundle over there to YouTube, Gower Crowd. Uh, what, how is it? YouTube.com forward slash Gower Crowd and make a comment over there. I will certainly uh, do my very best to respond to you. I would love to enter the conversation with you over there on YouTube. And of course, if you want to know more about Creighton, just go to GowerCrowd.com. Uh, find the podcast page over there. I'll, I'll put a bunch of links uh, on the uh, podcast page uh, or on the show page uh, for today's episode so that you can find Creighton and uh, learn more about him. Right. So that is uh, enough for my introduction. Let's get to it now with uh, Creighton Bildstein, who is uh, principal over there at Platt Point Capital. Here he is. Creighton, thanks so much for joining me today on the Real Estate Reality Show, our new series. I have I'm trying to remember how we met. We just chatted about that. I really can't remember. It might have been LinkedIn. You may have sent me an email. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get started, before we actually, before I actually asked you, ask you my first question, please tell me just a little bit about your background and what you do. Just a brief synopsis so everybody sure. knows where you're coming from. Okay. 
So right out of college, I moved from Denver to Los Angeles. I was in commercial real estate, leasing office space for a couple of years, missed Colorado. So came back. Uh, that was 86. Denver was an oil and gas cow town back then. Uh, <laughs> oil tanked. Denver became a ghost town. I got out of real estate. I just I couldn't rub two nickels together. I was on 100 percent commission. So started, built, and sold three companies, got out of the last one at the end of 2016, was looking for a business to start or buy. Uh, one of my uh, partners now, uh, I had known him for about eight years. We bumped into each other at a coffee shop, and I'm like, hey, what are you up to? I'm looking for a business to buy or start. And he said, well, I want to get back into lending. You know, I, I see a big opportunity because of the Dodd-Frank Act. It's really hamstrung the banks, created this big kind of vacuum between banks and hard money lenders. It's being filled by private debt funds. He had a list of about 200 of them. Mm. I've kept in contact with all my real estate buddies from the 80s, and they're all developers or running REITs or way up the chain at JLL or whatever. So kind of re, we, we basically married, we, we went out and mar, uh, mapped the market for all the private debt funds, married the two databases. And that was six years ago. And it's just been kind of hockey stick growth. And you've been doing a commercial, you do commercial debt and equity, right? Well. Yeah. So essentially we're brokers of debt and equity. Um, on the debt side, we do bridge construction and perm loans in the five to hundred million range. And then on the equity side, co-GP, LP and mezzanine in the three to $35 million check size. And uh, I, would you like me to tell you kind of what we did a year ago before the Fed started bumping rates compared to what we're doing sure, now? Sure, yes. And, yeah. and then okay. I'm dying to ask my first question, but go okay. ahead. <laughs> so, all right, I'll, I'll be quick. So, uh, you know, a year ago, uh, a, a typical client for us was a, a developer that needed help somewhere in their capital stack. And uh, we were focused on the 10 fastest growing markets in the country in terms of spending, you know, marketing dollars and whatnot. And so um, we were seeing term sheets for just using a ground up uh, multifamily or value add mm -hmm. um, on the debt side, uh, you know, six and a half to nine percent rates, non recourse, 80 percent loan to cost, a um, couple points. That was pretty standard. Well, now uh, you're looking at, you know, 11 to 13 and a half. And the, and the rate was fixed before. Now it's 11 to 13 and a half floating. 70 maybe 75 percent loan to cost and you can you know you can get higher with some stretch leverage and that type of thing but two to three points and still non recourse so harder and harder to get deals to pencil we're having this, an extremely difficult time finding lp um we're seeing a lot of scenarios where either someone's loan is expiring and they need a new one and they're looking at okay we've been paying you know we've had a three and a half four percent rate now we're looking at seven and a half, eight, somewhere in there. And so our net operating income has gone down because higher taxes, insurance, just costs in general. And now we're looking at this higher debt service that we're going to have to cover and they can't. Um, so that's one scenario. Um, another one is, you know, they've had a loan, it's floating and same scenario that's, it's, it everything's gotten more expensive that they can't quite cover. And then the last one is, let's say a developer put a shovel in the ground two years ago. Um, he's getting this stabilization now, had pro forma to sell at like a four to four and a half cap. And they're not finding any buyers, even, you know, five and a half or six cap. They got to take out the construction lender. And so all three of those scenarios to get a new loan requires them bringing more money to the table because the leverage is lower on the available loans and they're being underwritten to a higher cap rate. So we've got a lot of pref equity options, but that's super expensive money too. I mean, I just saw, I got a tear sheet yesterday from a group that's at like 13%, but that's the lowest I've seen. I mean, it, we're, we're seeing lots at 15% and, you know, big chunk of the back end. So that's, you know, that, that's, so our focus has changed from doing new development projects to helping guys who kind of are, got in a little bit over their skis and um, just experiencing some issues that we can help them with. So this is the quote that uh, you sent out. I don't actually think it's your quote. I think you're quoting somebody else, but I'm reading yeah. it now and I'm just going to tee up the question, which okay. you've actually perfectly uh, framed already anyway. But uh, so this is this quote. When you have free money, people do stupid things. When you have free money for 11 years, people do really stupid things. <laughs> My question is, 
what are those stupid things that you've seen being done that are coming to bear now? Yeah, yeah. And so that was Stan uh, Druckenmiller, who that's his quote. So, um, you know, I'm super active on real estate Twitter. There's some really great, just you, you learn so much. But the thing that you see on there, there are a hu- there's a huge spectrum of ages. And you can tell by just how, how they tweet and, you know, kind of what they talk about and whatnot. But the guys who are in their, let's say, early to late 20s, this is kind of their first downturn. They're still super uh, uh, bullish. Bullish, exactly. They they <laughs> they want to keep going. Let's you know. Let's make right. stuff happen. You know, we're gonna find some deals and stuff. Activity. Let's go. And I'm I've been through a bunch of you know up and down cycles. And so um, I think what what Druckenmiller was referring to is you buy something right now at a, let's say a five and a half or, or six cap. I mean, I think there's still <laughs> quite a ways to go. And I think cap rates are going to, you know, keep growing. And so you buy something now and um, you know, you, you've got the costs set now, but what happens if you lose a tenant or two, or what happens if taxes continue to go up or what happens if they jack rates again, and you've got a floating right rate and you're going to have to hold on until I, I have, I don't think we've even scratched, scratched the surface yet. I think we've you know got at least another year year and a half so you're going to have to hold on during that time period if you buy today you know i, I just i don't know I, I i've been reading uh steven Schwartzman's uh book about how we started blackstone and everything phenomenal book but he talks about how to ride an economic cycle and you shouldn't buy until and, and kind of how you tell things are coming back up is prices go up by about 10%. And that's when you should be buying. And it's just, you know, it's hard for everybody to be patient and and wait. But I, I don't know, I just I think, um, I think the, the stupid money that he was talking about is rates were low for so long. And you just, you really could, you almost couldn't make a mistake. And, and now, you know, we're going to see who who is making mistakes. Yeah, it's coming home to roost. So you're talking about what you're seeing on Twitter at the moment. But as you look back at deals that were done two or three years ago, how were they structured that uh, is inevitably going to be causing them problems today? Well, the leverage, you know, I mean, there was just crazy leverage. There were these private debt funds that were um, underwriting very sloppily. I mean, there's one we we we've got some great relationships with these debt funds and great great people, um, but one guy who left one of them um, told us we had coffee. This is probably a, a quarter ago or so, but he was saying that uh, in December he had three deals that he was kind of embarrassed to even present to the uh, credit committee, and his boss said, "You're going to present those things. You're going to get these across the finish line. You know, we want to get our bonuses. We want to get our fees, and you know." And and that's you know the the end of bubbles. That's the type of stuff that's always happening. You, you know, guys are just trying to get the money out because they know it's going to get taken away if they don't. So that exacerbates everybody. You know, the, the developers get excited too because it's like, oh shoot, this is a great deal for us. But in the long run, it may not be such a great deal for them. You know, yeah. just, you know, based on all that, uh, the, the the leverage is what you know. I think kills a ton of guys in the end so you so you saw a lot of deals that were fee fee driven on the uh on the debt side what about on the on the sponsor side where sponsors have uh you know been motivated by fees have you seen that uh i suppose um yeah well certainly motivated by the carried interest and i think that's you know what i'd mentioned earlier about these guys who put a shovel in the ground two years ago Mm -hmm. i mean you're not thinking you know back in 2021 you know you weren't thinking um oh gosh you know okay our project's not going to be completed until 2023 um you know are are there really going to be buyers out there i mean you 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 know this cycle went on for this up cycle went on for so long that everybody gets complacent and you do think you're going to just keep getting these fees and, and these big paydays when you sell the project at the end. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I guess that's, you know, 
the ba bad part on the developers is you know just not not understanding that there are cycles that you know the the, the cheap money's not going to be around forever so so uh and you your coffee for the guy that you had coffee with he said that th these deals that he was kind of uh strong armed into presenting to his uh investment committees yeah what was it that he didn't like about them what were the what were the components in there that were unhealthy uh, that's a good question I mean honestly I, I didn't dig in I, I don't know if it was you know developer experience location asset class loan size um uh, yeah I should have dug in but I don't I don't know for sure all right, so it's probably you know it's almost certainly this uh, you know the, the all of the above, right? Basically, yeah. Um, and uh, so you also uh, talked about uh, you know the the market coming down, but there, there are some good solutions, uh, yes. and uh, there are several types of loans. And so I kind of like to go through what these uh, these options are. I've got them up on my screen here. And the first yeah, okay. one to talk about is uh is a bridge loan so to sure. just like explain uh to uh to our viewers what uh what a bridge loan is and and how do they work and, and actually what i'd most like to know especially in a distressed environment right uh, Creighton, is how how does this impact limited partners how does it actually getting these deals done if right. they're distressed what is the impact on limited partners so let's start with bridge loans. And okay. Then so yeah. So essentially, a bridge loan is a loan that you know, let's say three months to two years is kind of the timeline, um, and it's just really a stopgap between getting permanent and uh, taking out another loan, um, or just acquiring something that you know. Let's say you've got a uh, purchase agreement in place, and it's you know you've got three weeks left, and you're freaking out because you don't have a loan yet, and a lot of these bridge lenders can do loans very quickly. I mean, we got a, uh, back in 2019, November, 2019, uh, one of our clients was buying two office buildings in Colorado Springs, seven days before they were supposed to close, um, their lender pulled out and they had 850 hard and all these LPs that were going to lose money and stuff. So we got them 20 million bucks, a $20 million one year bridge loan in seven days. And uh, so, uh, you know, they can be expensive. Uh, what kind of terms were you talking about then or what do they look like? Now? Yeah. So so that deal was eight and a half percent rate for, through a family office, which is, you know, that's not bad. Um, it was 75 percent loan to value, um, non-recourse. So, I mean, it was great. Everybody was happy. I mean, you know, points in, points in, points out and any points, extensions? Uh, two points to to the lender. I think we got a point, maybe a point and a half since it was such a short time frame and we kind of had to drop everything to, you know, all hands on deck. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, so um, we're seeing a lot of those scenarios right now where either uh, somebody who's going to purchase a property and they thought the bank was ready to roll at, let's say, a 65, 70% loan to value. And now they're saying, ah, oh, you know, um, we've got to kind of retrade on the rate because the Fed just bumped another quarter point. And we're now also tightening up within the bank. And instead of, you know, 70, 65, we're going to be at like, I mean, I was at a NAOP event a couple of days ago and they're all the banks were saying, yeah, we're going to be at 55% LTB. Really? So, yeah. So, so a bridge loan is just really kind of a stopgap to uh, inject capital, get a loan for a shorter period of time with the intent of at the end, you know, going back and getting a perm loan. And a lot of people are, are using them now thinking, OK, so rates are so high now, but the Fed's, you know, surely and in their mind, I'm not sure I feel this way, but, you know, the Fed's surely going to uh, drop rates in let's say, uh, you know, uh, six to 12 months. So let's get a short term and then we'll get a perm at a lower rate, you know, when, when this expires. And what are you so, seeing in terms of uh, costs of uh, bridge loans now? Not eight and a half percent. You're seeing something different. Yeah, it depends on the asset class. And we're seeing a lot of land. And so land deals, I mean, it's expensive money. It's 12 to 15 and two points to eight points. There's one group doing 12 and eight and they'll do kind of anything, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's crazy expensive money. So what are they doing? So what is the uh, motive apart obviously from the, uh, from the rate and from the fees? 
Is there also anticipation that these assets could anyway come back to them? In other words, yeah. they could foreclose on. Like, what's the motivation behind this kind of? Well, there there are some dirty, I guess I'll call them lenders out there that you know kind of loan to own. But every lender has to think that way because if you get it back, you know, I mean, how are you going to deal with it? Is is the value really there? And that's the other thing; it's so hard to value stuff right now. You know, I mean, the bid ask is so that gap is so far uh, apart now. We see. So you know, many- it's interesting. I've got to jump in there. Is yeah. it actually that difficult to value? It, well, frankly, it's in my IMO, as they say. I don't think it is. I think it's easy yeah. to value based well, on what's going on in the market. The problem is that sellers haven't really accepted that. We, that's it. That's what I'm saying. I think the sellers haven't because they're they're like, oh yeah, I've got we got an appraisal last year. Here, here you go. <laughs> right. Yeah, great. Well, based on historical so data. Yeah, we just had a, a weird experience where the first time we wished the appraisal came in lower than it did. And so this is a uh, an apartment building that uh the the sponsor uh you know it's it's uh it's essentially stabilized. They haven't taken out the construction loan yet. They haven't been able to. Um they're getting charged 250 grand a month for uh as penalties every month until they take this you know construction project so we're working on a uh, a uh, uh, preferred equity uh injection for these guys but the the pref group you know asked to have a uh, uh, an appraisal done and everybody was thinking that the value of the property was you know like 62 63 million the appraisal came in at 71 which was a four cap and we're like where is there a comp that shows that there's a four cap anywhere? I mean, show us. So it's, yeah, it's really messing up the deal because now the sponsor's like, well, shoot, maybe I should just sell this thing. And it's like, well, you're not going to find anybody to buy at a four cap. There's just no way, not even a, you know, four and a half or maybe even five cap. Because I mean, you can, on, on, you can get a 30 day T bill now. I think there, it's 4.55%. Yeah. Still I have, I have fully, I, don't, I, I have got no idea why would you, what I've invested in. Sorry, yes. because I have a, I have a financial advisor. He does it all for me, but I know I've got four and a half uh, li, uh, cash on deposit at four and a half percent, hundred percent insured, zero yeah. risk. Exactly. So um, I don't know. It, it's, <laughs> that's why I say it's difficult to kind of, you know, value stuff when you have those types of scenarios going on. And mm. uh, I, I don't know. So, so uh, it just uh, one last question on the bridge loan uh, yeah. at the moment. So are you finding enough bridge lenders to cover demand? Tons of bridge lenders. Yeah, there's plenty of bridge money out there. Mm. Um, it, like I said, earlier, the, the toughest thing for us to find right now is LP. LP, so uh, individual investors. What is an yeah, LP? Or, or, in in or, your or, world, yeah. what's an LP, uh, Creighton? Uh, limited partner. Yeah, so, no, I know. But what, oh, okay. what is, like, describe the, uh, the like, what, what is the... Uh, what is the ideal limited partner in in your world? Just in my, just to put that into context, limited yeah. partners in my world are people who invest twenty five thousand and above. Okay, so, so small yeah, accredited investors, you know, small. So, we, but in your world, an LP does what? Yeah, so in our world, an LP is typically a fund, and they come in. They're the only. LP, they're they're the only you know entity or whatever, mm-hmm. and so uh, they they. They're not as passive as, you know, a uh, friends and family or the, the, the accredited investors like you're talking about. Um, very sophisticated. Um, mm-hmm. They're probably going to have some input on who the uh, who the debt is. Um, they may have to sign on the debt. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it, and we're, we're typically looking at a check size, um, you know, three to thirty five million is, is kind of where they're coming in. OK, and they'll take major uh, decision right. Uh, vetoes and this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. All right, now uh, let's move on to the next type of uh, capital uh, that you've already referred to, preferred equity. So before okay. we actually get into uh, what, what, what the landscape looks like for PREF equity, please, for that one person who's watching yeah. now doesn't know what PREF equity is, what are the characteristics of PREF equity? Okay, so it's essentially a 
uh, slug of capital that comes in to kind of, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better way to put it, put a finger in the dike, you know, kind of uh, there's some kind of a scenario where there's not enough capital and uh, it, it, it kind of, it can kind of look like uh, an interest reserve. So that can be capital that's used to pay the debt service or, or whatever, but they're going to get a lot of say so, you know, in, in the operating agreement. I mean, they, uh, if, if the project goes bad um, or the, uh, you know, there's some scenario that goes the wrong direction, they can take over and, and, and it's almost like a, like the bridge loan, loan to own that I'd mentioned uh, earlier. So, you know, you've got to choose your, Pref equity partner kind of wisely. Um, but we are seeing th that's kind of three to 35 million is, is the, uh, the range. Um, what kind of rates, uh, Creighton? So, you know, rates and terms, yeah. we did see one for 13 a couple days ago, which is brand new, but it's, we've been seeing 15 and above, and then some kind of a, a waterfall where, you know, they'll, they'll get that first after the debt payments. So they'll get their PREF 15%. Then once that's been paid off, then it may be some kind of a parapasu with the sponsor. And then when the, you know that the, then when everybody's gotten their money back, there's going to be some kind of a split at the end. And uh, you know, it, it's all negotiable, but um it's probably going to be closer to 60, 40 or 70, 30, and the larger amount going to the PREF group uh, than the sponsor. Interesting. In all some right. Some scenarios, so that... I mean, if it's like really upside down, I mean, you know, the sponsor might be lucky to get, you know, five or 10%. I mean, it, it you know, uh, it's, it, and it can look more like kind of a rescue scenario. Right. And uh, so my next question actually relating to PREF equity was going to be, how, and I type, I'm typing these out as we talk, how high up the capital stack was it? Will a pref equity uh, lender go? No. But it's actually the wrong question. What? But it, how? What? How, how does that look against loan to value? So with a pref equity, you've already got you've got senior debt, right? That came in that maybe at seventy percent for argument's sake. But now the asset value has dropped, right? So how, so how are they evaluate? How are your pref equity clients evaluating how much to lend? And, well, and that's that's a great question because every one of them are a little bit different. Uh, they want an appraisal. It's just it's really a negotiation. Um, and I, I'd say that we you know what we've seen is you know up to 80, 85 percent, I'd say is kind of uh, what the standard has been of current value, right exactly. yep, I see. And then when an, a pref equity investor comes in, what happens uh, to the LPs in a deal? They get squished. Yeah, I mean, they're going to get squeezed for sure. And it's better than, I mean, so the, the typical scenario is um, the sponsor figures out that he needs to either get a new loan or take out a, an existing loan. So he knows he's going to have to bring more capital to get that. So, you know, the okay, so the chain of events is, do I have the money as a sponsor? No, I don't have the money. So I talk to my LPs. My LPs either don't want, either don't have it or don't want to put more money into a, an asset that's going down in value. So then the options are give the keys back to the lender, which the LPs really get hurt. Fire sale, same thing, they get hurt. Pref equity. So that's kind of the, the best of the three kind of bad options. <laughs> interesting and do you see uh, so actually i was talking to mark roderick uh earlier this week uh, he's yeah. a crowdfunding attorney and he was talking about preemptive rights what i've always heard the term is uh rights of first refusal so are you seeing lps with preemptive rights and are uh, to uh to take you know to providing any pref equity and if they have it are they taking it up well that's a really good question i mean it really kind of depends on how how bad the situation is and kind of and from the beginning negotiating that in how sophisticated are they and you know is that and generally something like that is in place mm. so uh yeah that's a battle and and lps are you seeing them picking up on it or just like figuring it's bad money after good yeah i mean and again i mean it really does depend on how dire the situation is so um you know and just all the time that's involved in that. And, and really, um, I, I do think we're at the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot of, you know, kind of maneuvering and trying to work things out as opposed to 
because if cap rates you know continue to go up as I think they will it's just going to get worse and worse so if they can figure something out now as opposed to kind of delaying everybody's going to be in a better situation all right so the next uh form of capital uh that uh, you've written about is rescue capital all right yeah. so uh what's rescue ca again definition and then what's the world of rescue capital yeah like? so rescue capital is kind of um uh, that, I mean, it, it, uh, how do you best describe? I mean, essentially, it's it's groups coming in, looking for distress scenarios, um, looking at sponsors that are in a really tight, tough spot who are, uh, you know, on the brink of giving a project back to the lender. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it's, you know, coming in kind of maybe a short sale kind of s situation or you know, really picking up a, a property at a discount and still keeping the sponsor in at a super small sliver but it's better you know again than giving the project back mm. so, but it wipes out lps uh, it, it generally not always i mean the lps might be able to stand to i mean it, there, there's just not really kind of a standard situation mm. everyone is is very different so um and rescue capital takes the form of pref equity and mes debt and what, what yeah form or they or it could be a scenario where you know you're going in uh jointly with the sponsor to the lender and saying hey look we're going to take this thing completely off your balance sheet and you know for that you know we feel like we're going to keep the sponsor in and the lps maybe it it, it depends on the rescue capital groups uh, you know kind of what their model is what they're looking for um or they could they could come in and just kind of rip these guys heads off and say hey look at least you're not having to bk on this thing mm -hmm. so uh there's just a, a lot of different scenarios that can you know that rescue capital can be used for the last of the uh of the four types of capital and this one is really interesting i'd love you to dive into this one a little bit i've done a lot of work in the past on ground leases omg right. i love these 99 year ground leases that are suddenly right. coming to you know the end of their term oh my right. goodness like hong kong so what happens to hong kong right. uh, but ground leases are very very interesting and and you've described a scenario here that is actually quite interesting so can you first of all describe exactly what a ground lease is and how it might be able to help distressed uh owners at the moment uh solve their problems sure so ground leases essentially are a you know an entity coming in and buying buying the ground so it's no longer fee simple um which is disconcerting to the lenders I mean you have to make sure that you've got lenders that are comfortable with it and part of the issue too is um there aren't that many groups that are doing you know the money groups that are doing ground leases so you're either looking at like two or three groups that will do from like 25 million and above and then we've got a couple groups that'll do smaller deals but essentially you know it's it's cash that you can take out of your um your development or your uh property and use it for i don't know you know essentially anything but how does that work? So you've got a let's just let me just kind of unwrap that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got a lender who came in and say you've got a multifamily uh, operator who bought a value add, uh, and they're they're in trouble now for you know all the above reasons that we've sure. About. Now they took out a first position loan, so they've got a lender, right? Uh, and that lender, and then they brought in an, uh, all that equity, but that lender has the building and the land as security for their loan so how does a ground lease sale work exactly that, that's a great question and I, you know I'll, I'll be honest with you we've worked on a number of ground leases we've not gotten one across the finish line mm. um so I, uh, I I wish I could answer better um and if you'd like I'd be happy to you know introduce you to it might be worth another session you know podcast to just focus 100 percent there mm. um the the one group that we've done we've worked on a lot of deals with so they'll come in they will uh they'll provide uh up to 33 percent of the projected after built value of the project mm -hmm. and then you can they, they've got a uh, formula where uh, you can buy the property back in uh 
within five years and you know at, at different prices but they use par plus a percentage and um their rate is about seven percent so when you blend it with the senior if it's you know a ground up project that you're just getting into um it can make uh the, you know the numbers more palatable and, and the deal pencil mm -hmm. but uh in a um uh kind of a rescue scenario or a, or a you know a, a bad a project's going down you can use it but we've not done it yet so i mean i'd mm -hmm. be blowing smoke if i sat here and tried to tell you you know how, how it works how it actually works all right so, and, and so i always get you know when when we've got a, a scenario where it might work i bring those guys in they kind of go through the whole their spiel and, and tell everybody how it would work so interesting all right well it is yeah. an interesting angle let's uh let's definitely follow up on that yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Creighton uh, so I'm going to I'm trying to keep these now these uh, uh these episodes uh down to commute time and okay. uh because I figure it's uh yeah when you're in the car you want to yeah. listen to something hopefully something intelligent uh for uh for as long and the average commute in America is 30 minutes of course here in, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not in LA, as I mentioned, but when I get back to LA, commute is probably, you know, three hours each way right. uh, for, the, for the four miles that you've got to drive. <laughs> uh, but uh, but let's start, uh, let's start wrapping up so that we stay yeah. in that, uh, that limit, if you don't mind. Let me ask you a couple of final questions. One, okay. I am going to ask, I know everybody loves this, but I'm going to ask you to peer into your crystal ball okay. and tell me what do you think is, how do you think commercial real estate market or industry is going to roll out over the next what do you think is going to happen over the next let's call it you you said six to 18 months what do you think is going to happen where do you think the opportunities are going to be okay so i think the fed bumps rates one more quarter point because they had initially said a while back that they wanted to get to you know 5.6 percent for banks so i think there's one more bump then i i think they stay in the first quarter at least of next year um i think this puts so much pressure on the banks especially the small community and regional banks so they're going to have all these assets on their balance sheets you know loans that they're if they have to mark to market that's really going to be an issue yes and so i think you know i think it's very similar to the snl crisis from you know 1990 mm -hmm. and uh i don't know if that means they come you know they they uh uh form an entity like the RTC to sell off these assets or whatever mm -hmm. I think there's going to be tremendous opportunity for groups who have money that can buy them up and that's how a lot of wealth was created back in you know the early 90s just like in uh 2000 you know 9 through 11 or so when when groups that had money were buying up non-performing notes and real estate taken back from the banks and whatnot. I, I think it's going to be another kind of scenario like that, but it's going to be on the commercial side rather than the residential side. And so that's, I don't know, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking. Oh, I love it. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, for that summary. Cool, but, you, know. Uh, you know, I like to, I like to put a little quote at the very beginning of these episodes and that is it. You've just, <laughs> I don't have to search for it. That's perfect. <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, you know, we asked, I saw an article about, uh, I, I do want to drill down on this before my final, final question, but sure. I saw an article ever so briefly, I scanned the headline, I have to confess, uh, without reading it yet, uh, it's in my inbox to read, but that the, the uh, Fed is looking to tighten standards on banks, and you mentioned this to mark to market, right? Uh, just explain again to that one person that doesn't understand what that means. What is marking to market and why is that major news if that happens for banks? Yeah. So um, let's say that they did a loan on a $10 million property and that's what they underwrote the loan to. Well, if the, you know, if cap rates go up and let's say that property is now worth eight and a half, uh, you know, eight and a half million, um, that reduces the, you know, the, the, the asset, the, the collateral that they have against that loan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the regulators make them have a certain percentage of, you know, ratio of assets to collateral or, or excuse me, collateral to, to loan amounts. So, um, yeah, that, that can, uh, you know, bring on a big wall. Then, then they've got less money to loan, it's just, you know, it's kind of a big, um, 
Well, it also means that a yes. lot of loans, a lot of loans uh, start to look uh, substandard or uh, exactly it's like right. changes everything in terms of the way yeah, the, the whole bank... risk. Uh, yeah, the risk reward ratio. So, yeah. So my last question, Creighton, uh, what and I ask this of all uh, all my guests. All right. What resources do you like to use or do you find the most helpful in keeping your finger on the pulse of what's going on in commercial real estate? Resources that ideally are accessible to uh, to everybody. Uh, but if there are some, uh, you know, propriety databases, that's fine, too. Yeah, no. Um, gosh, that's a really good question. I mean, there are just a ton. I have so much information coming at me mm. um but i use as a matter of fact i'm sitting here in front of my computer so i can tell you a couple of them that i really <laughs> like exactly um, i mean i do use google um you know you can um customize what data feeds you see every day and so i use different search terms and it just kind of consolidates it all for me so i'll you know use distressed real estate and mm. Um, ground up construction loans and a couple things like that, but uh, TREP is good. They've got some very good information. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the guys that track. They, they're the guys that track CMBS. Exactly. Yeah, and a bunch of. I mean, they've got great articles every day. Um, CRE Daily is very good. Um, let's see, BizNow. You know, they they kind of. They they customize it a bit for each major city in the country, but they've got a lot of you know a lot of the articles are are similar and, and they get they get pretty granular, pretty good stuff. Um, the real deal, yeah, I think yeah, the deal. That's some that's some pretty good stuff. Um, and then there's and and you mentioned Twitter as well. Yeah. That's kind oh, of oh yeah, Twitter. So do you have any? Do you have a Twitter list, Creighton? That you uh, you well, I'll tell you. Um, I I could yeah I could send you uh, kind of all the folks on Twitter that I think are really good. But if you just go in there and you search um, hashtag uh, retweet, so just hashtag R-E-T-W-I-T. Yeah. And you can, you know, that there's, my guess is, I don't know, you know, 2,500 regulars on there. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I met with uh, one of the guys who's insanely prolific, great guy, strip mall guy is his, uh, is his tag uh -huh. and uh he's in new york city he does nothing but strip malls and uh, he he raised a big fund for strip malls he worked for a family office buying strip malls for 20 years he went off on his own about two years ago um he had a party in new york city about a month ago i got invited there were a hundred of us and it was great people from all over the country actually there's somebody there from israel somebody there from belgium um it was insane really fun and and like Good people. So well, that's a really good insight. Oh. I love the idea of a hashtag retweet. Yeah. Real estate twit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that. All right, I'm going to start posting with that hashtag. So yeah. keep an eye out for it. Creighton Bilstein, we'll Principal Platt Point Capital there in Denver. Thanks so much for joining hey, us. Hey, thank you. Today. Really appreciate it. It was nice to get to know you a little bit. All right, that was Creighton Bilstein, Principal at Platt Point Capital, who is a commercial debt and equity provider based in Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And if you did enjoy uh, today's show, please let others of your friends and colleagues know about it. It's there at gowercrowd.com. You can also find it on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash gowercrowd. And uh, while you're at uh, gowercrowd.com, just go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. There's a big red subscription button top right. It's totally free. comes out every Wednesday. And we are the only shop in town that covers the uh, commercial real estate industry uh, syndication. And colloquially, it's called crowdfunding industry. And uh, we send out updates uh, every Wednesday, what's going on in the industry. And we are focused on distressed real estate, what's going on in the industry, how to survive and thrive during these uh, difficult times. Creighton, thank you so very much for joining me. It was a pleasure to meet you. Appreciate your insights. And thank you also, uh, dear viewers, for having joined me today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as uh, I did and uh, learned as much as I did as well talking to Creighton today. And uh, I will see you next time.
uh, in this series of the Real Estate Reality Show. For now, though, this is Adam Gower signing off. <laughs>